Eric, we are here in sunny Florida, but most of our listeners are suffering through the long, dark winter season. So with them in mind, do you know what the difference is between snowmen and snow women? I don't know what. Snowballs. It's the Paperback Warrior <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to episode 73 of the Paperback Warrior podcast. My name is Eric, and I'm here with my broadcast partner, Tom. Paperback Warrior is the internet's finest resource for reviews and discussions of vintage genre fiction from the 20th century. You know, those cool paperbacks from 65 years ago with those attractive painted covers? Well, we review those books at paperbackwarrior.com, and we do this weekly podcast on Mondays, where we tell you the stories behind these old books and the authors who wrote them. Let me throw it over to Tom to tell you what we have in store for you this week. Tom, you over there? Yes. Thank you, Eric. Today's feature is about an author who really made a name for himself writing short stories for the pulp magazines in the 1940s and eventually transitioned to becoming one of the prolific and respected authors of the paperback original crime novel era of the 1950s and 1960s. His mother called him Gunnard Hirstedt, but the reading public knew him as Day Keen. I'll also be reviewing a Fawcett Gold Medal book from 1957 called So I'm a Heel by Arnold Hanno, writing under the pseudonym of Mike Heller. Eric, what is your review this week? This week I'm going to be reviewing Gale Warning, written by Hammond Ennis. This book was also released under the title Madden's Rock, but I'll get into all that during my review. Okay, sounds good to me. Before we get into our feature, I want to tell you about some new acquisitions into my library. I haven't really taken my show on the road in a while, but I developed this bad habit that brings books into my life. See, my 16-year-old son is a big fan of the NFL. That's professional football for you foreigners. He loves football. And I'm his 50-year-old guy, and so I'm always grasping at whatever I can find to relate to my kid. So I've been watching a lot of football with him this season. Now, I, I enjoy the sport, but I'm way more of a casual fan, and it's not like our home team of the Jacksonville Jaguars has given me much to cheer for this year. So I watch football with him and uh, my wife on Sundays, but I'm only kind of paying half attention to the games. I end up playing with my phone, looking at book reviews and searching on eBay or Amazon for good deals on books I may find interesting. So if I see a book that looks interesting, I'll bid on it or hit buy it now on the eBay auction. I also have search terms saved so I can shop for books while I'm half asleep on the couch. The result is that books end up arriving at my house from the sellers that I barely remember buying. It's usually a nice surprise because I, I hardly even recall that I bought these books in the first place. So I want to tell you about this book that I bought in my Sunday football stupor. The first book in question, I want to, I guess the book I want to talk about, is a Fawcett Gold Medal book from 1954. It's a paperback called Let Them Eat Bullets by Howard Schoenfeld. Now, do you own a copy of this book, Eric? What a name. Uh, no, I don't own that. Okay, well, you do now. Uh, All right. Here, grab this for you. Oh. I'm handing this across to you right now. You ever seen this? I haven't. All right. Yeah, it looks really good. Okay, so I bought it a while ago, and I forget that I already owned it. Uh, so it, I, this happens to me once in a while, and it always fills me with rage every time I make this mistake. Um, I couldn't even get off my butt to walk over to check the bookshelf to see if the book was there when I order it in a stupor online on a, a Sunday. It's actually kind of disgraceful. But it got me a free book. It did. Uh, so I suppose that is the upside. Uh, anyway, Let Them Eat Bullets is about a hard-boiled private eye named Jerry Nelson, whose secret weapon is that he has an identical twin brother— who is a distinctly soft-boiled college professor. Now, Jerry enlists his brother's help, and hijinks, mix-ups, and fake-outs ensue. In his New York Times review back in the 1950s, Anthony Boucher said the book has gangsters, blackmail, corpses galore, and a nympho-sadist with arrested development. What a combo. Yes, there's something for everyone in this book. <laughs> The book must have been a success because it went through three Fawcett Gold, Medal print, Fawcett Gold Medal printings between 1954 and 1959. The odd thing is that even though the popularity and the good reviews of this books were there, Howard Schoenfeld never wrote a sequel. The twins gimmick would have been perfect th idea for a series. Yeah. You can just beat the, ride that horse into the sunset. Yeah, no doubt. Instead, this was his only novel. 
He did write stories for Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine and the debut British edition of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. He was also a television writer for NBC on a TV show called The Atom Squad about a secret government agency dealing with threats involving radiation and nuclear technology. But as far as novels go, Schoenfeld was one and done. A friend of the show, James Reasoner, told me that he loved this book. And Eric, now it's yours. We're going to have to just race and see who reviews it first. Yeah, thanks, man. I really appreciate your uh, generosity. And it would sort of be a slap in the face if I read it first, so I'm going to leave the honors to you. All right, cool. You can just add it to your collection. I'm sorry I'm off mic here. I'm reaching over for this one. Lastly, an author sent me a copy of his new book that came out last week. The author in question is none other than Max Allen Collins. And the book is called Skim Deep published by Hard Case Crime. Now, it's the first new book in the Nolan series in 33 years. Now, for the uninitiated, Nolan is a world-class thief very similar to Richard Stark's Parker character. The Nolan series launched in 1973 with Nolan number 1 bait money and has been reprinted several times since then, including a Hard Case Crime double called Two for the Money that basically took the first two Nolan books and put them in one volume. Anyway, this new one that I'm waving around here in my hand looks great. Nolan goes to Las Vegas on his honeymoon and finds himself at a mobbed-up casino, and things get hairy and action-packed. Now, I remember reading a Nolan book when I was in high school, but I have no recollection of which one it was or anything about it, but I remember loving the book. And uh, I want to read the series properly, and so I need to decide whether to read and review this new one that Max Allen Collins sent to me or just start tearing my way through the series in proper order. I don't know if series order matters at all, but with the Corey books, it really doesn't. So I just don't know if it matters for the Nolan books. And so my question, Eric, give me some advice here. What would you do? It's kind of like a moral dilemma. Mr. Collins sent me this new book to review, but I find myself a bit unprepared because I haven't really read the old ones yet. Well, how long is the series? How many books? Seven, let's say. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm guessing, right. but yeah. it must feel like it's, it's more than six, two. six, seven books. Yeah. All right. Yeah, similar thing happened to me with uh, R.A. Salvatore's fantasy series starring uh, the elf Drizzt. And I read the first two or three books, and dude, I absolutely love them. And then I ended up shelving that series for a decade or more. And my dad read the whole series recently and was telling me how good it was. But I'm torn on picking up where I left off you know, decades ago or a decade ago in the series or going back and just rereading those books again just so I can kind of get back in the mood. Um, so I'm not really sure what I would do. Yeah. I've, I've got nothing. All right. So in any case, I want to thank Max Allen Collins for sending this book. It, it looks great, and I will read it. More importantly, you, the listener, should buy it. Now, the cover is awesome, as all hard case crime books tend to be. Now, I'm honored and a little more than starstruck that Mr. Collins sent me this book himself, and he even signed it, Eric. Best of all, the envelope that he packed it in, has his return address on it. So now I could actually drive to Max <laughs> Allen houses and try to borrow money or just sit outside and stare at his home. I know you're kidding, but these uh, publishers aren't going to send you any more review copies if you behave like a stalker. All right, so listen, if Max Allen Collins ever got into a car accident in a snowdrift and broke <laughs> his legs, I would bring him to my cabin to nurse him back to health and not let him leave until he wrote me a new quarry novel because, Eric, I am his number one fan. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mr. Misery. Do you have a feature? Yeah. Why don't you play the transition music before someone puts a restraining order on me? All right. So our feature today is about an author named Day Keen, one of the most prolific and highly regarded authors of paperback original crime novels in the 50s and 60s. But before we start talking about his books, let's go through some background on the guy. His real name was Gunard... Herstet. I'm going to spell this to, uh, for you because it, it, it's H-J-E-R-S-T-E-D-T. And although his name sounds like that of a European immigrant, he was actually born in Chicago in 1903. His dad was a paving company contractor named Alfred Herstet, whose parents were immigrants from Sweden um, to the U.S. Now, that's why his name looks like a bad scrabble hand. Now, how did Gunnard Herstet become day Keen. Well, his friend and author Talmadge Powell tells the story like this. I'm going to do my Talmadge Powell imitation. When he began writing for the magazines, he went up to an office of an editor who told him, the name is absolutely impossible. 
I would like the cover. I would like to cover mention this story, but I'm not going to put that name on the cover of the magazine. Why don't you pick out a good pen name to work under? And on the spur of the moment, Day remembered that his mother's maiden name was Daisy Keeney. Day thought to himself that if I can't use my father's name, I'll use my mother's. And he contracted her name to Day Keen. Now, legally, he also changed his name to Day Keen. Let's back up a little bit uh, to a time before he started writing. He became a traveling stage actor in the 1920s, traveling the country, performing in plays, as well as the vaudeville circuit. He used the name Day Keen also as his stage name in 1922, performing, and he also performed a few times as in the Gunard name. He played Rosencrantz in a traveling production of Shakespeare's Hamlet. In 1931, he was living in New York, and he sold his first story to the pulp magazines. Now, his first sales were to to Detective Fiction Weekly and West Magazine. He returned to Chicago later in the 1930s and started writing for radio shows, including Little Orphan Annie and Kitty Keen Incorporated, a program about a female private detective that first aired on CBS and later the Mutual Radio Network for the years 1937 to 1941. You can imagine at this time he was honing his skills as a writer with a quick production schedule, basically doing his reps for his future career as a high-volume writer of fiction prose. In 1938, he relocated from Chicago to good old St. Petersburg, Florida, with his second wife, Irene, who had been a Chicago high high school teacher. For a bit, uh, he tried to continue writing radio scripts remotely from Florida, but eventually shifted all of his energy to writing stories for the pulp magazines. As I alluded to earlier, the only way to make a living doing that was to write compelling stories fast and crank out a lot of them. So Badekin enlisted in the Army in 1942 in Pinellas County, Florida, and I can find no record of him being shipped overseas or seeing combat. I don't know how all that worked back then, but he was 39 when he enlisted. What I do know is that his time in the Army really didn't slow down his writing for the pulps. During that Pulp Fiction era of 1940 to 1952, Keene authored 250 published short stories. People always associate him with crime fiction, but he also wrote stories in the Western genre and the sports pulps as well. He sold another 16 short stories to the Digest after the pulp magazines died off in the 50s. He used the pseudonym John Corbett for stories when there was already a Day Keen story appearing on the, in an issue of the magazine, so his name didn't appear twice in the table of contents. In the late 1940s, he relocated to Los Angeles and bounced between St. Petersburg, Florida, and L.A. It appears actually that his, during his entire adult life, he spent his time in those two cities, kind of going back and forth. Now, if you're interested in exploring Day Keen's short story output from the pulps, you don't have to spend a fortune on old copies of Dime Mystery Magazine. There's a reprint publisher called Ramble House that has published six trade paperback volumes of his stories. Each edition is about 250 pages long and collects about 10 stories each. They cost about 20 bucks per volume, and you can find them at Ramble House website or just search for Day Keen in the Detective Pulps, and it'll pull right up. Now, Eric, I think you have one or two of those volumes, right? I do, and I've thumbed through those books periodically, and uh, they're loaded with good content. The two volumes I own also have uh, really good introductions just explaining uh, Keen's attention to the shorts and the pulps. Um, they're definitely worth owning if you like this author. Yeah, one of, one of those volumes, I think, has a great introduction by one of my favorite authors, Robert Randizi, who says that Day Keen flipped a coin to decide whether to be an actor or a writer when he found himself at that life crossroads. Uh, those of us who, old, who love old paperbacks are, are kind of happy with the result of that coin flip. Anyway, so our story continues to ni- in 1949. Keen turned his energy to writing novels. Now, Eric, let's see if you've been paying attention for the past 72 episodes. Why do you think Day Keen switched gears from short stories to novels in 1949 and into the early 1950s? Hmm. Could it be the birth of the paperback? Well, yes, the birth of paperback original novels, because paperbacks had been invented 10 years earlier, but they were just reprinting old hardcovers. Oh, yeah, yeah. But they became all the rage paperback original novels in 1950 or so. So Keene's first novel was Framed in Guilt from 1949, which actually was originally released as a hardcover, but then it was quickly re-released as a paperback from graphic books. As an aside, Framed in Guilt 
was also released in Great Britain under the title Evidence Most Blind and remains in print today uh, from Starkhouse. So Keene hits the ground running during the paperback original era. During the 1950s, he wrote and sold about 30 books until he began writing longer, more mainstream novels in the 1960s. And we're going to cover some of the ones we read in a moment, but here's some interesting trivia. The book Love Me and Die from 1951 was published under the name Day Keen, but it was actually a collaboration between Keen and Gil Brewer. Imagine that. Yeah. Now, he utilized a couple pseudonyms other than Day Keen during this era. His Father's Wife was a book from 1954, which was reprinted as by Daniel White in 1970. There was a book called Dead Man's Tide from 1953, later reprinted as It's a Sin to Kill, and that one was published under the pseudonym of William Richards, a name he also utilized back in the day for selling a story to a true crime magazine called Underworld Detective, which was edited by Lionel White. Such an incestuous world back then. Yeah. In fact, that novel, Dead Man's Tide, which was also just reprinted by Stark House, was an expansion of a short story he had written called Wait for the Dead Man's Tide from the August 1949 issue of Dime Mystery Magazine. Now, this recycling and expansion of short stories into full novels was really common back then. Keene sold a short story called She... This one's tough. She Shall Make Murder Mm. to Detective Tales in November 1949, and that became the basis of a Keene novel called Joy House, written in 1952. The novel was actually rejected by multiple publishing houses and finally put out in 1954 by Lion Books. The book's also been reprinted by Stark House and remains available today. The editor of the novel at Lion Books is none other than Arnold Hanno, and I'll be reviewing a book by him later in the show. See how this ties together? It's like an episode of Lost. (laughs) Early in his career as a writer, Keene signed on with a literary agent named Donald McCampbell, who also represented a fellow St. Petersburg, Florida author named Harry Whittington. How about that? Keene and Whittington became lifelong friends and used to hang out in the same Florida writing clique, along with Gil Brewer and Talmadge Powell. Imagine being able to grab dinner or a beer with those four guys together, man. Day Keen, Harry Whittington, Gil Brewer, and Talmadge Powell at one table. It'd be like meeting the Beatles for you and I. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, I mean, needless to say, I'd be absolutely starstruck. I mean, Brewer, Keen, and Whittington alone are three of my all-time favorites. I'd be so giddy, man, like a like a schoolgirl in 1964 <laughs> running after the car. I know, exactly. <laughs> like yeah, a lunatic. I, I thought the same thing. So Keene was also friends with Florida author John D. McDonald, but my impression was that McDonald didn't really hang out in the same clique with those other dudes. Anyway, McCampbell, this literary agent, had relationships with the big publishing houses, which is why you see that Day Keene's books and Whittington's books always wound up at the same paperback houses. Now, I've heard he provided Fawcett Gold Medal right of first refusal on these books during the 1950s because Fawcett paid the best and the fastest. Keene could make as much as $4,000 by selling a book to Fawcett. If Gold Medal declined the book for whatever reason, it went down this prestige hierarchy to graphic books and then other publishers like Lion, Ace, Avon, Pyramid, Phantom Books, Original Novels. In the 1960s, Day Keen switched gears from mystery and crime fiction to thicker mainstream novels. The ones I've seen around uh, the most from that era are L.A. 46 from 1964 and Chicago 11 from 1966. I got a couple of those books here, I think. Anyway, he died on January 9, 1969 in North Hollywood, Florida, North Hollywood, California at age 65. During his life, he wrote about 50 novels over 250 short stories, and 1,500 radio scripts. That's a lot. I know. Thanks to reprint houses like Stark House and Armchair Fiction and Wild Side Press, many of Day Keen's greatest hits are really still available today. So let's get into those books, Eric. First thing to know is that Day Keen never had a series character, really. We'll explain the one caveat to that. For a lot of guys, you can think of Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer or John D. McDonald's Travis McGee. A successful series character really made you financially set for life. But Day Keen, for whatever reason, never never went that route, with one small exception. Keen had a private detective character that appeared in two novels. The character was a private eye named Johnny Aloha, who I think was of Hawaiian descent, but based in California. He's an ex-Marine who fought in the Korean War. 
Now, the two books in the Johnny Aloha series, if you could call it that, were Dead in Bed from 1959 and Paola from 1960. Now, Dead in Bed has been reprinted by Armchair Fiction, and I gave my copy to you, and you actually read it recently, right? Yeah, that's right. And I'll tell you, upon my first attempt, I didn't really like it. But then in preparation for this episode, I decided I'd revisit the book again. And Tom, I read it in almost one sitting. Um, Johnny Loha is a, a successful private eye in Los Angeles. Right before he starts a much-needed vacation, Aloha is approached by a beautiful woman who wants to hire him to find her missing mother. Aloha originally declines, but then realizes he was friends with a missing woman before the Korean War. The book doesn't read like a traditional Day Keen novel, and I thought it was more of a cut and paste from all the successful private eye storytelling of that time. You know, like Frank Kane, Richard Prather, Brett Halliday, which was Davis Dresser. You should love uh, Keen's take on private eye characters if you like those kind of books, I guess. Now, the thrilling detective website said that the uh, Johnny Aloha books are similar in to Carter Brown's sexy mystery. Did you find that to be the case? Um, I've only read the uh, the one character from Carter Brown, and he was kind of a goofy guy. I can't remember what his name is, but uh, no, I didn't. I didn't sense that. All right. Anyway, I had it was. Did he end up going to Hawaii in the book you read? No. Yeah, interesting. I used to live in Hawaii uh, for seven years, and so I thought that the books might actually take place there. Um, but I still may give it a shot. Anyway, uh, the point here is that all other Day Keen novels were standalone books. Yeah. Tom, I want to add, though, that Keen did have series characters outside of paperback books because he had characters like Doc Egg. He had Silent Smith. And he had a detective agency called McPherson, McReady, and McCoy. And he would have these characters re- repeatedly appear in the pulp and dime magazine stories and this goes back to what we talked about earlier he also had one of those detectives that had the the physical flaw uh, okay he had one arm and uh, his name was matt mercer and from what i understand a lot of these um pulp stories were compared to earl stanley gardner's um lester leith and senior lobo Interesting. Okay, so yeah. he did have series characters, but they were done in the short stories yeah. and novellas from the pulps. Yeah, so no, no full of novels. Not, not that they've really seen the light of day much, other than these reprints from yes. Ramble House. Correct. Anyway, so on the on the Paperback Warrior blog site, we reviewed about nine or ten Day Keen novels. I think all of them, except for one, were by you, Eric, and one was mine. I also read a hard case crime reprint called Home is the Sailor by Day Keen, but I read that before I started writing for the site. So in the interest of time, let, let me have you walk through your three favorite Day Keen books, and I'll weigh in on the two that I read as well. So Eric, go ahead and pick a favorite. So the best book that I've read by Day Keen so far is Joy House from 1954. It was made into a movie in 1964 starring a young Jane Fonda. Hmm. The narrator is named Mark Harris, and he's a Hollywood attorney to the stars. A violent crime makes Mark into a fugitive from the law. He runs to Chicago, and he gets this job as a driver for a wealthy woman who lives in a spooky, run-down house filled with mysteries. There's seduction, there's twists and turns. In parts, it almost reminded me of like a gothic horror novel. In any case, I really enjoyed it. Again, the book is called Joy House by Day Keen. And it remains available today from Starkhouse Books. Okay, so probably the most famous Day Keen book to modern audiences. This is 19, 1952 paperback, Home is the Sailor. The reason it's so popular today is because it was reprinted by Hard Case Crime with a cool cover back in 2005, back when the, that publisher was at the top of their game. The book's about a merchant marine in America named Sven the Swede, whose ship docks in San Pedro, California. Immediately, he gets into a drunken fist fight at a dice game, and he kills the other dude. He wakes up in a motel with a hot blonde, but the $12,000 life savings that was with him is seemingly gone. I actually thought the story meandered a bit and became bogged down in the romance between the Swede and the blonde. I didn't hate the book, but it was no masterpiece. Again, it's Home is the Sailor by Day Keem. Uh, Go and tell us about another one, Eric. Uh, another keen book I can recommend is called Sleep with the Devil. Uh, it was also from 1954, and again, it's currently available from Stark House. It's about a collector for a loan shark who beats a guy to death and is considered is considering killing his boss and swiping his boss's money. The collector does what he does, and I'm not going to spoil it for you here, but he relocates to a small town where he assumes a false identity as a Bible salesman. So it becomes a fish-out-of-water tale about a guy who wants to be done with his past, even if his past isn't quite done with him. It was another one by Day Keen that I really liked, and again, it's called Sleep with the Devil. 
Excellent. Another Dane Keen book I read was called To Kiss or Kill from 1951. It was his fifth published novel, and to my knowledge, it has not been reprinted. And that's probably because it's not very good. The setup here has been done a million times. Barney finds the corpse of a beautiful woman in his hotel room and then needs to clear his name that he didn't kill her. Complicating matters is the fact that Barney was just released from an insane asylum. (laughs) Day Keen had an opportunity with the setup to really create a propulsive narrative. Instead, it's this slow examination of Barney's sanity. And the solution to the riddle is a real letdown. Uh, Do not bother with To Kiss or Kill, Eric. Uh, Do at least one more. The last one I'm going to recommend is Death House Doll. And it was half of an ace of double from 1953. It's about a Chicago woman on death row for murdering a diamond salesman. A guy named Mike befriends Mona as a dying wish to his brother, who had been Mona's lover. As Mike explores Mona's case looking for a loophole to keep her from the electric chair, Real questions arise about whether Mona committed this crime, despite the fact that she's pleaded guilty. A lot of characters live in a gray area between good and evil, and I really appreciated that nuance. Uh, Again, the book is called Death House Da, and I think it's actually still in print from uh, those guys at Prologue Press. Well, good. You've clearly had better luck with Day Keen than I have, and I recognize he was super talented, but I'm still looking for his masterpiece. In his essay, Robert Randisi said that Day Keen is generally seen as a cut below Harry Whittington, Gil Brewer, and Peter Rabe. What is your assessment of Day Keen's talents? Oh, geez. Um, well, he's mostly just an enjoyable mid-shelf wine, if you want to think of it that way. Um, he's always dependable, and I don't think you're... Aside from the one that you mentioned earlier, I don't think I'll ever hate any of his books. I don't think you will either. Um, Some are better than others, but I think that just comes with the mileage. He's not a guy that strays too far from the middle of the road in terms of sex or violence. I mean, he can stay slightly edgy, but no one's ever going to accuse him of being a controversial writer, in my opinion. Got it. For my, for my part, I'm not giving up on the guy. Uh, listeners can and should visit the paperbackwarrior.com site and click on the Day Keen tab on the right side of the desktop uh, for all of our Day Keen content. I need to give some credit to the people who uh, helped me out with this. There's this outstanding blogger who is actually an online friend of mine named Cullen Gallagher, who has a website, pulpserenade.com. He's my go-to guy for all things Day Keen. Now, Starkhouse, I'm handing this over to you because you're the fam, just released a three-book compilation of Keen's novels, uh, Dead Man Tide, Dead Man's Tide, The Dangling Carrot, and The Big Kiss Off. And it just came out this month. Uh, the new Starkhouse release has an introduction by that guy, Cullen Gallagher, called Run for Your Life, Day Keen's Wrong Men. And I use it as a resource for this feature. So special thanks to Cullen for pulling all this info together. There's also a guy named David Lawrence Wilson who wrote a great introduction to the Starkhouse re-release of Joy House that was helpful, as well as the late Bill Kreider's column, Gold Medal Corner, currently available at mysteryfile.com. I also find a helpful article on the blog Tellers of Weird Tales that filled in some of the blanks about Day Keen for me. Uh, Yes, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I also utilized an article written by David Lawrence Wilson also that was featured in the fourth volume of Ramble House's Keen Short Story Collections. That's where he found the... I found all the pulp series characters. Yeah, Wilson does a lot of work for uh, Starkhouse writing, like very kind of um, smart introductions to their uh, their books. And I really, I'd like to meet the guy someday. I really admire him. Yeah. So uh, that's it for Day Keen. Why don't you go ahead and do your book review? Okay, listeners, you may remember last summer I reviewed a book by Hammond Ennis titled The Lonely Skier, and it was known as Fire in the Snow here in the U.S. You can hear my review of that book on episode 49 of the show, but... I can probably save you the trouble and just tell you that I absolutely hated it. It was boring, and most of the action takes place in the smoky bar at a ski resort. But I bought a stack of Ham and Ennis books last year, and I just couldn't resist the awesome covers, um, so I picked up another of the author's books. This one is called Madden's Rock. Uh, that was the title in Europe, and it was called Gale Warning here in the U.S. The book was published in 1948 and remains in print still to this day under the Madden's Rock name. Now, the book starts in a Russian town called Murmansk. The time period is the closing weeks of World War II. The book's main character is British Corporal J.L. Varney. Most of the book also features Varney's brother-in-arms, Bert Cook. Now, these two soldiers are within a small company of troops in Murmansk, awaiting departure back to England. Missing their leave on the Queen Mary... 
The troops are desperate, and they take an assignment guarding a small stack of crates on a British freighter called the Tricala. Now, Varney immediately begins to suspect the crew are dangerous. While they're headed back to England, the ship is attacked by a German U-boat. Within minutes, Varney suspects that something's fishy about the attack. As his men are being ordered into the lifeboats, he finds that someone on board has disabled the boats by removing parts of the bottom. And the whole thing seems to be a frame job. This book was so good. Uh, Once the ship sinks, the narrative turns into this epic journey for Varney and Cook. Ennis builds in some courtroom drama, some prison life. He does another dangerous nautical journey towards the end, and just a ton of adventure. Tom, this book totally redeemed Ham and Ennis for me. Okay. And and I understand why his name is associated with uh, guys like Desmond Bagley and uh, Alistair MacLean as a as a founding father to the high adventure, you know, whatever you want to call that brand of storytelling. Uh, it was just so rugged, and it took me all over the Atlantic. And I just can't say enough good things about it. If you're looking to explore this author or maybe this early brand of adventure storytelling, look no further than this one. Again, it's under the title of Madden's Rock or Gale Warning, and authored by Hammond Ennis. You can find used copies under both titles and still get modern printings under the name Madden's Rock. Uh, Tom, it's your turn. Tell us what uh, what book you chose this week. Okay, cool. So I'm going to be reviewing a book called So I'm a Heel by Arnold Hanno, writing as Mike Heller. Now, Arnold Hanno was a journalist, soldier, author, and baseball fanatic, and he wrote this Fawcett Gold Medal paperback in 1957, published under the pseudonym of Mike Heller. Now, this it's a pretty short novel, and it's been compiled into a three-book volume of Hanno's work called Three Steps to Hell, published by Starkhouse. Our narrator is a Southern California tow truck driver named Ed Hawkins, who suffered an injury during World War II, resulting in an artificial plastic jaw holding his contorted face together. Somehow, despite this disfigurement, he uh, lands this nice wife and a beautiful son, despite uh, his facial issues. Inner beauty, man. Inner beauty. Exactly. Uh, ha- women are women are like that. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, Hawkins learns that a local big shot lawyer with political connections was caught a few towns away molesting a high schooler whose parents opted to not press charges. And so our hero, our anti-hero, decides he's going to blackmail the lawyer. Now, while contemplating the shakedown, Hawkins spends a lot of time rationalizing the morality of his actions. In doing so, he kind of breaks down the fourth wall and challenges the reader's own assumptions about right and wrong. It's really kind of an interesting literary gambit that Hanno employed, and he's really an excellent conversational writer. He's got this very distinct literary voice. As you may expect, Hawkins' scheme meets some serious bumps in the road, and the blackmail story was very compelling, and I really couldn't figure out where it's going. There's a hot-to-trot dame involved and plenty of dark twists along the way. But I have to say the final act got really weird and uncomfortable. I'm not going to give it away on the podcast, um, but I'm still trying to decide if the conclusion worked for me or not. There's also a local politics subplot that was kind of hard to follow, but it didn't really take up much space in the novel, so I can forgive that. Overall, I really enjoyed So I'm a Heel. Arnold Hanno is a solid author, and you'll never be bored with his plotting. Despite some unusual turns, he wrote an effective story and a memorable lead character that's really worth your time. I would check out the Starkhouse reprint uh, because it has three Hanno novels compiled for one price. I actually think Arnold Hanno is still alive out there, well into his 90s. And if anyone knows him, tell him to check out the podcast. Eric, I think we've gone a bit long, so uh, that's going to be plenty of content for today. Why don't you say so long to the listener? Hey, your uh, your Tomich Pow voice that you use there. Have you ever considered just driving down to Disney and doing voiceover work? Oh, uh, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't afford the cut what, and pay. What is that? Like your old man voice, dude. <laughs> I'm going to be bringing the heat here in 2021. Oh, man, I so can tell. You're going, to, you're going to hear some amazing... I'm the rich little of, of vintage right. paperbacks. I look forward to it. Uh, that wraps up another episode of the Paperback Warrior podcast. Check out our daily reviews at paperbackwarrior.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And join us next Monday for another exciting episode of this podcast. On behalf of Tom, this is Eric saying so long, listener. <laughs>